good. Now my Haramai, to celebrate the University of Canterbury's 150th anniversary, the Department of History is welcoming back and honouring a real diversity of our graduates from across the decades. Ko Katie Pickles, Toko Ingoa, and I'm going to ask our guests about their memories of their time as a student, discuss their life since graduating and how history has proved useful, and seek advice for those studying history today and into the future. Our special guest tonight is Andrew Hampton. Andrew is Director General of Security at the SIS. Before joining New Zealand Security Intelligence Service, Andrew was Director General of the Government Communications and Security Bureau, the GCSB, for seven years. Prior to the GCSB, Andrew spent much of his career in the justice sector. He's helped negotiate treaty settlements, worked in courts administration, and leads significant change programs. His roles in the justice sector include Director of the Office of Treaty Settlements, Deputy Secretary for Courts, and Deputy Chief Executive at the Crown Law Office. Andrew was also Deputy Secretary and Director of the Secretary's Office at the Ministry of Education. As the first Government Chief Talent Officer at the Public Service Commission, Andrew was responsible for identifying talented people in state services and strategically developing their skills and experience. Andrew started at the University of Canterbury in 1989, and he's got a BA in History and Political Science, and a BA Honours and an MA Distinction in Political Science from the University of Canterbury, all of the degrees. He's also attended the Oxford Strategic Leadership Programme. Andrew, thank you for coming home to the university, and in particular to the Department of History tonight. It's great to have you here. I wonder if you've got a few memories of your time as a student back in 1989. Uh, kia ora Katie, it's a, a real honour to be part of um, this webinar series and it's great to be reconnecting with um, Canterbury University. In some ways I feel I've, I've never really left because I grew up in, um, in Ashburton. Um, I have strong family connections down in Canterbury. My mum, her first, she was the first of her generation to go to um, university. She went to Canterbury and my son's studying down there at the at the moment. Look, I've got lots of um, great memories of my time at um, Canterbury. You know, I loved, I loved the study and we'll talk a lot about that, but I also, you know, I was 19 years of age, keen to be away from home, enjoying living in the halls. I, you know, um, worked at student radio throughout my time there, loved going out and seeing bands and all the rest of it. But I, I was a very conscientious student. I was very organized. And you know, when you're asking about memories, one of the memories I do have is um, I'd write all my essays, at least at the undergraduate level, longhand. And I'd be very organized, have them done a week in advance. I'd post them down to my little sister who I'd pay $20 an essay to um, pipe out type out for me and then post them back up. And, you know, I'd then get stressed out when my friends and flatmates would be doing all these nighters, all nighters to get their essays done when, of course, I was already working on the, on the <laughs> next one. Handy sister. Yeah. And in terms of what I studied, though, I, um, as you noted, I studied history and politics, but they were, they were closely related. And there's really been two enduring themes through what I studied. The, the first was a, a real interest and passion for um, the history of our, our own country. Um, in particular, um, Crown Māori relations, um, the Treaty of Waitangi colonization. And I rem remember very fondly attending um, stage one New Zealand history. They had their lectures at four o'clock on a, on a Friday with um, Dr. Um, Anne Parsonson and 
um, Tartipino Regan, really stimulating um, lectures that um, have impacted on you know how I've thought about our country, how I've thought about um, the treaty throughout my my career. But of course, come five o'clock, I'd be heading down to the student union for for happy hour. And so that New Zealand history theme was common throughout my studies. The other theme though was around um, really 20th century history, the world wars. I did um, Vincent Orange's um, papers on World War I and World War II. I did Professor McIntyre's papers on the, the Commonwealth. And again, really influential because the events of the 20th century obviously reshaped the world and continue to reshape the world. And if there's, I guess, an overlapping theme between those two, two areas, it's how New Zealand's own identity and own sense of place in the world has evolved. And in some ways, my career has really been all about those, you know, those two things around um, the treaty and around um, New Zealand's place in the place in the world. You definitely, uh, you put in all of what you learned has been a really good context. The con mm. yeah, the content for what yeah, background good background for yeah. what you've gone on to do. That, that, all of that knowledge, it seems, yeah, di directly <laughs> that way. So if we think about your life since graduating, and and I started off doing a bit of a this is your life, and, and there's so much there. Um, yes. so where where did you go to first when you left university? The first role I did was as a policy analyst at Tapuni Kokori, the Ministry of Māori Development. Um, I did have the option of going off and doing more study overseas, but I thought, look, it, I was already old for my class. My friends, a lot of them didn't go to university. I was keen to start working. So I headed off to Wellington and um, at Tapuni Kokori, I worked on a, a range of really interesting um, issues of the day from electoral reform. This was a time when we were moving towards MMP. Um, I worked on um, constitutional issues, on treaty settlement policy, on the draft declaration on the rights of Indigenous people. Worked with incredibly um, stimulating people like Sir Wera Gardner, Heke Parata. They were all, um, you know, both leaders and mentors for me at the at the time. But I moved from there after a couple of years into um, the Office of Treaty Settlements, which was part of Ministry of Justice that was responsible for negotiating the settlement of historical treaty claims. And I did that for eight years and ended up being the, the director of the office. And that job really is about history. You know, yes. that office exists to um, help resolve um, treaty grievances based on um, breaches that the, that the Crown committed and the ongoing consequences of those. Now, treaty settlements can never, can never turn the clock Back. They can never provide full compensation for the losses that occurred, but if done properly, they can help bring about um, a sense of resolution and provide a platform for the future. But that will only happen, or only did happen, if the Crown really confronted its history, the wrongs that it had done. And so I remember um, some of the most humbling experiences I had was sitting on Marae and hearing iwi Māori talk about the impacts of colonisation, not just on their ancestors, but on, on them, but then working together to try and find a way in which the Crown could record what had occurred in the settlement, put that in legislation, but most importantly, acknowledge the breaches of the treaty and apologise for it. So that was really the first 10 years of my life, working in that treaty settlement area. Which is real history, is it? It's real history. And it's history in make the making of history through that very moment, yeah, yeah, of redress. So, so that was yeah a whole first area area that you did that was directly drawing upon content that you'd learnt in the history books and been lectured by Tatipani, etc. And then just going into the world in the working world and yes. enacting and, it. And, and you know, I applied those um, skills that I learnt by studying history, and I'm sure we'll talk about that that later on, yes. but this was also um, about grappling with different views of 
history. So obviously the Crown had its view about what, what happened. Fortunately, in most negotiation, there was plenty of um, excellent research done. Now I know that you've had um, you've had Vincent O'Malley on, um, yes. and he has done amazing work in that area. If there had been a Waitangi Tribunal report like the Open that helped to you know provide a strong historical basis. But still, in the negotiations, there were points of difference, points of contention around how the Crown would actually record what had happened, what it would apologise for. And so in some ways you were like having to negotiate history, having to come up with a view that was accurate, but that um, both sides could live with and view was a fair um, representation. And that yes. often was marrying up the historical re research that had been, been done with the oral history, with the findings of the Waitangi Tribunal. Um, really challenging work, but incredibly rewarding. Um, yes. Part of the process of you know, validation of um, ensuring that we'd got the balance right involved us engaging you know, very eminent historians like um, Bill Oliver, for, for example, or Claudia Orange, and getting them to review where we had got to, to see whether you know, um, they considered it was a, a fair representation. Yes, so it will be really stim stimulating, but also challenging. Yeah. And because um, it seems all, all of the jobs you do are incredibly responsible jobs, where there's a real onus on getting things as right as you can. Is it that whole justice sense of yes. it? it? Seems a real theme in everything that you do, I think. Yes. <laughs> I've been lucky, though, that I've worked with amazing people, including in my time in treaty settlements. You know, I, I managed for a while the um, team of historians. Um, and they were just um, so dedicated to the to the work, but dedicated to getting it right, which um, you know helped me to make sure I was making the right decisions. Yeah, that's good. That that whole team teamwork, isn't it? Yeah, and bringing the, everyone's skills together is a real part of it. So history has obviously proved useful to to you. I think we can say mm. uh, and. If everything you do in, in your working life uh, that way. So can we talk a little bit about your work in, in national security? Because it's absolutely fascinating. And again, how, how it connects in and how, how you got onto this. Yes. So, you know, the first half of my career was working in that um, treaty settlement area at the Crown Māori interface, which was incredibly, incredibly stimulating, but I knew I couldn't do it for forever. So... I then did a range of jobs, as you talked about, in um, the justice sector and the education sector, often involved with um, change programs. But, you know, I've always had a strong interest, as I said right at the start, in New Zealand's place in the world and um, and those forces that, you know, impact on our our national security, you know, how we can avoid war, how we can um, avoid conflict, but also how we can protect what's most important to, to us as, as New Zealanders. So it was probably inevitable that I'd end up in the national security um, area. So my first job was, as you noted, running um, Te Tita Tiaki, the Government Communication Security Bureau. Now, um, the role of the GCSB is twofold. It is an intelligence agency, so it collects intelligence, so that's information that's not readily, readily available to help inform decision makers, and it's largely foreign focused, so focused offshore, and it operates in the um, electronic world. The other part of the role is around cybersecurity, so providing cybersecurity services to protect New Zealand's most important information. And look, that was an amazing job, um, but seven years is um, enough time in any, any role, but I wanted to stay within the sector. So I was fortunate in that I got appointed to the role earlier in the year as Director General of um, Te Pā Whakamarumaru, the NZSIS, the New Zealand Security Intelligence Service. It works very closely with the, the GCSB. Um, 
But whereas the GCSB is largely externally focused, NZSA's primary focus is around domestic security. And whereas NZSIS, um, or whereas GCSB works primarily in the electronic world, the NZSIS at least traditionally had been what was called a human agency or so a human intelligence agency. So it's about collecting intelligence um, via humans directly and also about providing um, protective security advice, advice around um, people and around facilities. So things like running the government's vetting process, for example. In a world though where everyone nowadays has cell phone or access to a laptop, that, that distinction between human and SIGINT is blurred. So that's why our agencies work closely together. So, so that's just a bit of a, a rundown on what we do as agencies. But I actually found that um, the skills that I'd learned, the knowledge that I gained as a historian or a, a history student was as relevant to those two roles as it was to my work in, in treaty settlements. Mm. And in some ways, that's because the skills of an intelligence officer aren't that different to the, the skills of a, of a historian. So part of it is about being able to um, assess a large amount of information from a variety of sources to test the validity of that information, then to organize it in a way which is easily understood and can be presented objectively, but also in a way that is, is compelling. Mm. It's also though about being aware that there's biases often in both sources, but also in those who collect and assess those sources, including intelligence officers, mm. just like there is with, with historians. So um, I actually found a high level of transferability in, in those skills. Mm. It's interesting, there's quite a number of historians um, working in the New Zealand intelligence community. And when I talk to, to them, they've made the same point I have. But there is a bit more to it than, than that. Um, spying, so particularly running, running human sources, um, intercepting communication. Um, it's been described as you know the second oldest profession in the mm. in the world. You can find examples of spying in, in the Bible. You can find examples of um, spying. Um, in classical times, Alexander the, the Great, he ran spies. Julius Caesar ra ran spies. You know, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I, you know, she had a mm. spy master. So um, there's a lot of history to, to, to what we, what we mm. do. Mm. But the, there are two other reasons or two other areas where I think history is really relevant to what we do. The first is, you know, intelligence agencies are very mission focused. We have a lot of people with amazing technical skills, but it's really important that we understand the broader context that we operate in. Mm -hmm. So in the national security business, whether you're talking about counter-terrorism or geostrategic competition, those threats all have their origins in history, much of it in that 20th century history that I talked about. So having people in our organization who understand that wider context is really important. It's also really important that agencies like ours own our own history. You know, I'm incredibly proud of um, NZSIS. I was also incredibly proud of um, GCSB and the amazing work that our staff do every day to protect New Zealanders and New Zealand interests. But we know that um, our agencies um, have operated in times where the government has had um, priorities, which looking back now, you know, may not be viewed as the right priorities to have. Similarly, you know, mistakes have occurred. And I'm a firm believer that if agencies like ours are to maintain social license and uh, have the um, public support and understanding to do what we need to do we need to be upfront about our history as well and so 
and it's something I can talk about later on, but we've been increasingly active in how we can get more information out into the public arena about what we have done, including um, often quite historical information. Yes, no, definitely. And that's the context of history, isn't it? Yeah, everything, yeah, yeah understanding that things change and yeah, what people consider to be spied yeah. on in the past isn't necessarily what yeah. happens in the, the present or even the future. Yeah, definitely. Because you um, do you have a museum that we, yes. that sort of yeah. said you it's, collect your own history and it's it's yeah. not open to the public, unfortunately, but um we have a a well curated museum which includes, you know, um whole range of information from you know um spy kit to you know um artifacts relating to you know targets at the at the time to you know newspaper clippings it's um it really does help bring to life the work we have done yes. but also within NZSIS we have a dedicated team they're quite small but their focus is on declassification of our um our historical records now there'll always be limitations on what we can release publicly. You know, sometimes um, the human sources that we use to derive or to collect this information, they are still alive or their children are certainly still, still alive. Some of the techniques that we use um, in years gone by are still relevant to what we do now. So there'll always be limits, but we are challenging ourselves to how can we put more information out into the the public arena. So, um, you know, recently there's been a history of the NZSIS, or at least our predecessor, mm -hmm. the special branch of the New Zealand Police, that um, just come out. Um, we worked um, closely with the authors to give them as much access to information as we could to declassify information. But also, we get regular requests from members of the public, you know, some of them who, you know, were intelligence targets or they thought they were intelligence mm. targets asking for mm. their, their files. And we work really hard to try and release as much of that information as we can. And, you know, coming back to what I said before about, you know, each organization has a history. It operates in different times. And, you know, I was signing something out just the, the other week where there was, um, a woman who had been involved in various um, leftist causes throughout the the seventies and into the into the eighties, and yep, she, in accordance with the government's priorities of the time, we collected intelligence against this person. Mm -hmm. And so I've tried to release as much as we can to her. I found it quite jarring, you know, things like the fixation that you know we had at the time around her marital status, for mm -hmm. for example. Yes, so a real reflection on yeah, changing society, yeah. changing norms, yeah, yeah. The, which we historians love. Don't it's just absolutely intriguing and yeah, how some things do change that way. And yeah, okay. absolutely. I think people are always fascinated if yeah, with what they don't know or what they wonder about. Is it? It's, yeah, well, definitely. one of the things that we're um, focused on is trying to proactively release material, but we have. Um, a large number of requests from individuals, um, Privacy Act requests, um, Official Information Act requests. And so we always need to prioritize those. So I, I often feel quite torn between trying to respond as helpful as we can to individuals who want information, mm -hmm. but also trying to work on our longer term project, which is actually proactively putting information mm -hmm. out there. And you know, we're hoping in the next couple of years that you'll start mm -hmm. seeing seen some of that including interesting stuff like you know not just the service you know spying on left-wing groups but actually you know our predecessor special branch um collecting intelligence against um fascist groups in the mm. 30s in New Zealand things like that things like that yeah it's like sounds like there's quite a few um master's thesis for some budding <laughs> historians in there because it's yeah. always like new sources and new aspects of the past like yeah and rethinking it it's just um yeah, all always, always declassified sources are always, uh, there's, yeah, we get lists of them and scramble to race to the archives and look at them. <laughs> so, uh, so let's uh, 
chat a bit more about your sort of um, advice for those who are studying history today and into the future who might be thinking of, of a career as perhaps an intelligence officer. Um, what what would the, would their job involve doing? Okay, well, you know, look, within the intelligence community, we have a wide range of range of roles. So in NZ, NZSIS, um, in the operational area, we have people who do run sources. You know, they make contact with um, people who can provide us information. Of course, everything that we do needs to be in accordance with priorities that are set by government, um, is properly authorised um, and the like. But yes, we undertake that type of old fashioned spying by running sources. We um, collect intelligence by surveillance. That's, you know, mm. technical surveillance, listening devices, all of that type of stuff as well as physical surveillance, following people around. So, you know, we do have those sorts of jobs. Um, increasingly, though, um, intelligence, um, human intelligence also involves um, doing data analysis. So accessing information, again, it all needs to be properly authorised. And much of it is open source to be able to identify, well, you know, what we talk about is the, you know, unknown unknowns who are the people who aren't on our radar who may be of con concern so yep we need people with those um technical skills the computer scientists the engineers the data scientists we've got lots of those and in my old old place the um gcsb large number of people they're in quite a well-established graduate program but in addition, we've got a whole range of other, other roles. We have a legal and compliance team, as you would expect. We have people who work in the finance facilities area. Um, and those functions are shared between the two agencies. We also have staff whose jobs it is to, you know, help, um, you know, manage our interface with um, community groups. So who do community outreach. We have people whose job it is to, you know, help with communication, help getting information out there. And on the protective security side of the both agencies, there's a lot of people who go out and work with organizations to help give them advice on how they can protect themselves from threats. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole range of roles. And as I said, we have people with history degrees in there because I think a lot of those history skills that we've already talked about around the ability to analyze information, to spot bias, to organize that information in a way in which is objective but compelling you know that's core to our our work so you know what's my advice if there's someone who's interested in working for for us in studying history keep studying keep studying history you know the more um passionate you are about something i think the better you better you do and we're always after people with good good marks um in terms of fields of study well you know the stuff that i've talked about is is relevant, particularly things that relate to, you know, New Zealand's place in the world, our international relations, but it is as much about the skills as it is about the content. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that I would say, though, is um, some of our, for both agencies, some of our best graduates are those who have a bit of hybrid vigour in what they have, they have studied. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they may have majored in they may have majored in history, but they've also, you know, done some coding on the side, or um, they may be someone who is a computer scientist, but they've done some international relations or some, some economics. And I think why that's really important is it helps, you know, um, develop that ability to be agile and adaptive, which is which is really important to our work. But it also, as I touched on before, helps with context. Mm. You know, having people who have really great technical skills is fantastic, but they've got to understand the context we operate in. You know, what is the historical background to why this threat has, a, has emerged? Um, so look, you know, th there are a couple of, couple of bits of advice, but you know, look, don't be mm. shy in applying for roles. We have a, um, a great recruitment website for the community called Beyond Ordinary, because that's what we're after. <laughs> we're after we're after people who at one level are, are ordinary and that they reflect the full diversity of New Zealand society 
but we want them beyond ordinary because you come to our place and get to do stuff you don't get to do in any other in any mm. other organization mm, i like that. i like the hybrid vigor that's yeah. a nice way of putting it, is it? <laughs> hybrid vigor and yeah and the beyond ordinary because i think what's so intriguing about the sis is that it's that serving in silence mm. the the whole idea of um that it is secret that what that what you're doing and because it is so important and it, and it needs to be um yeah it, it, it's sort of like um and 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 your success is also silent it, it's, yes. yeah no um that is that is the language that we that we use we we largely serve in silence and part of that is for very practical reasons for for agencies like ours to be effective most of what we do does need to be in secret. If people who are wanting to do New Zealand harm or New Zealand interest harm knew exactly how we went about doing our job, or we wouldn't be very effective at, at, at doing it. So that is that is part of it. And yes, um, you know, when when things go wrong, they tend to happen um, publicly. It gets into the public arena. When things go right, I when we've helped mitigate threats, we've helped build resilience, we've helped, um, we've just helped raise raise awareness, or we've informed the government to make um, more informed decisions. None of that gets into the public arena, mm. but that's okay. We we have a high sense of pride and celebration within our community. And you also have the added benefit that the TV news never or the radio news never looks the same once you've worked in our place because mm. chances are if there's a contentious um world event or um domestic national security matter that's made it into the public arena there'll be a wave there'll be a huge amount more information that people in our organization are privy to that won't ever be made public yes i think that's what's so um, intriguing i guess it comes back to those of us who like history as well as we we like um knowing what's going on and, and knowing particular uh, sort of stories and versions of of events and if and in the past we like to nut that out too but for the present and what you're dealing with like you say we we don't actually know do we 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 can um it's changing and there's sort of an information overload and swamping of information everywhere but it doesn't mean that the the sort of the depth and the stories are actually uh yeah any uh, are reliable you know so. you, you look at um alan turing who as you would expect is an icon within our mm. organization within our our community um all of the work that he and others did in um Bletchley park um yes. breaking the german codes well mm. none of that was known publicly until the 1970s yeah as a result and still more of it's been declassified now as a result, all of the history, obviously, that was written about World War II up until that point, it, it did have to be revisited because mm. it missed a big part of the, the history. And I, I sometimes feel that some of the, the matters that, you know, we are involved in, um, that, that fuller context, that fuller understanding, probably it will be a few decades before it gets out into the, yes. out into yeah. the public arena of yeah. ever. But yeah. as I said, it's it's a requirement for the role. Our agencies would not be effective if we um, weren't able to keep our equities, so our our methods, our um, our relationships, our sources. If we weren't able to to protect um, those, I do stress again, though, and it's a point that I've touched on um, a number of times that because our agencies do operate in secret because we do have powers that are intrusive. Indeed, um, much of what we do would be illegal if it wasn't our agencies doing it. The fact that we, well, essentially the basis in which we are able to operate is that it is subject to a very stringent authorizing environment. We don't set our own priorities. The priorities are set for us by government there uh, warrants that are required that in most cases need to be signed off by the minister and if they involve um, a New Zealander, um, the commissioner of warrants as well, who's a, um, who's a retired um, judge, often a 
Court of Appeal judge. We're subject to independent oversight from the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, who is someone from outside of our agencies who can come and look at whatever we whatever we do. There's a dedicated um, committee of parliament. Indeed, I met with them today, which has both the prime minister and the leader of the opposition sitting on it, who scrutinize um, who scrutinize the agencies in terms of our, you know, um, our our budgets and our priorities and, and the like. So having worked across government, yes, we're subject to the Official Information Act and the Privacy Act and the um, and the Public Finance Act, and there are some carve outs to that, but we're actually subject to more scrutiny, more oversight than any other agency mm. I've worked for. And that's mm. a good thing given the nature of the work we do. The nature of the work, yes, no, definitely. Gosh. It's, it's absolutely fascinating uh, talking with you, Andrew, and just, yeah, the, the importance and, yeah, it, it's such an important job you do, and it, it sounds like it is really rewarding, but um, also, yeah, incredibly responsible, and, uh, yeah, when, when things are well, we don't, we don't hear, and, uh, yeah, that's sort of that whole side of prevention, so yeah. just want to really say thank you extremely much for coming home to, to history and, and political science in the University of Canterbury, your alma mater in this, our, our 150th year, and we're really proud of you, it's lovely to have you back, and uh, just to hear about some of what you've been doing, been really busy, and to just see um, how it all connects in together and what, what the practicalities are of history and, and of history making a difference. And uh, yeah, it, absolutely fascinating. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, yeah, it's been really enjoyed. And just thank you for keeping us safe and for, and for all you do and for just all the sincerity and, and for your intelligence that, that you do bring to, to what you do. So thank you very much. And we will, um, yes, let, let you go. And uh, thank you, go well. And thanks for coming home to us in history. Ka kite. Thanks, Katie. Really enjoyed it. Ka kite no. Oh.